I'm going to uh, talk tonight about uh, Claude Monet a little bit and my interest in Monet and work that I've done that's related to Claude Monet. Um, I always, when I'm in an audience, I like to know what I'm getting into. So um, there are 67 slides. Um, just so, I mean, not that you, maybe someone brought a counter along. I don't know. You can keep going. <laughs> but uh, just so you know what's, where, where we're going. And I'll try to. Um, try to have this last about 40 minutes and then I'm happy to take questions. Also, if you have a question and uh, want to interrupt and, and, um, and shout it out, um, I know there's been an open bar there for a while, so I, uh, <laughs> I, that would, um, I'm happy to take questions uh, along the way because I realize uh, by now um, some of these things that I made that make perfect sense to myself and seem um, totally comprehensible are, uh, from the outside, pretty incomprehensible. Um, so the, uh, the first image, um, my interest in Monet started when I was in graduate school in Rhode Island. And this is a painting that um, is probably the painting I know best in the world. And it's a uh, 1874 painting by Monet of the basin at Argentoy, which is a area where the Seine sort of pools um, uh, and, and, and slows down. And uh, so it's an early Impressionist painting. <clears throat> and I was, um, I get, when I was in graduate school, I was uh, not a painter. I was more of a, a smart ass. And <laughs> my, um, I decided, I, I, but I, I was interested in the idea of Impressionism and the, and especially the sort of, this, this was the late 80s and there was something that was called the institutional critique where people were really thinking about, well, what is the role of the museum and what does the museum do to make us think about art in certain ways? And I was um, really uh, thinking about the sort of popularity of Impressionism and how how it would be, how it was just to sort of please the masses. And um, so uh, I, I was very dismissive of Impressionism. And um, so a friend of mine dared me to, uh, he said, well, if it's so easy, why don't you copy, uh, why don't you try doing it yourself? So uh, one great thing about the RISD Museum is that you're allowed to paint in the galleries and as a student. And so, I, uh, <laughs> this is ridiculous, but I copied the painting. I went and I, um, I, I had my jumpsuit that I wore in the studio and a friend of mine uh, bought me a beret to wear. <laughs> and I, then I, I, <laughs> I wore a sign on the back of my, my jumpsuit that said, I'm wearing this beret under protest. <laughs> and, and I copied the painting. And uh, there is my copy, which uh, hangs in the bathroom of my studio. It's not so bad. Um, and uh, what happened, um, weirdly, um, I mean, it took a while, but it became a, a kind of Stockholm Syndrome thing where <laughs> I fell in love with my intended victim and, uh, and was, have been, in some ways, under the influence ever since. Um, it took a while, and I'm not mad about all Impressionism. I, I can't really stomach Renoir at all, but I, uh, I really, I, I, I find Monet incredibly interesting for many reasons, and, and hopefully some of that will come up tonight. Um, but first I had to get certain things out of my system. And for my graduate thesis show, in which uh, at that time the uh, exhibitions were uh, for graduate students who were still held in the museum, I um, rented out my 150 square feet of the museum to a costume jewelry company that was located in, in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, called Monet. And I, they still exist. And, um, and I used the whole sort of uh, system of the museum. On the, on the right there, you can see there is a gallery guide, this little brochure, I'm sorry, on the left, of. Um, where people could read about the, this was the um, 1989, the, the like new line for 1989 of the Monet costume jewelry. And there was a card and so forth explaining a postcard uh, uh, with, the, with the jewelry. And um, 
I, um, I, I guess I sort of succeeded in my goal, which was probably to infuriate the museum director. Um, and uh, so uh, hopefully I've not infuriated this museum director yet. <laughs> that shows what happens. You know, you just sort of get so mellow. It's pleasing people all the time. But it was a, <laughs> it, it was a, um, this idea of, of critiquing the institution was something that, that was interesting at the time, and that's sort of what got me into, um, into thinking about Monet in a more uh, optical and uh, practice-based uh, way. Here's an early work that I did. Um, this is sort of, I guess, the first work that I, I think of as my, my grown-up work. When I, um, when I moved to New York after graduate school, and I became really interested in certain kinds of color theory. And I, I really started thinking about, rather than the sort of um, uh, art as a social critique, and as I, th as I thought about art as a social critique and started thinking that, um, and this is a, this was a subject for another whole nother lecture <laughs> about why I, I was less interested in that. I really became interested in color theory and uh, certain um, philosophical ideas about color. And I be became obsessed with a slim volume written by Ludwig Wittgen Wittgenstein called Remarks on Color, which is still an incredibly important book to me, where he really talks about color and language and the sort of play between, between the two. Um, it's sort of a riff on uh, Goethe's uh, color uh, theory and a, and a reaction to that. But it's, um, it's really brilliant and thoughtful and has sort of served me um, as, a, um, as, a, as a sort of boost for, for thinking about color in a, in a, in a conceptual way. So uh, this work um, was uh, actually, that's, it's funny I forgot this, but the, if you see the frame that this work is exhibited in, I forgot when I did the, uh, when I copied the uh, Monet painting, I also copied the frame in clay. I forgot I was quite this crazy. Um, and I, uh, so I copied the frame in clay. I molded the, the frame that the painting was done in clay and then cast it in plaster. So this is a fragment of that original, of the original frame that I did of, of, uh, of the Monet painting. And um, what I did was I went to uh, the Grand Canyon with a crate of glass and closed my eyes, looked at the Grand Canyon, and then wrote the colors of, that I saw when I closed my eyes. And um, this was uh, the best one, which is a Wittgensteinian uh, contradiction called reddish green. So there was this moment where the sun was shining through my eyelids, and I saw both red and green at the same time. So um, this is, um, this was reddish green. It was uh, the beginning of um, a sort of way of working that I continue to do to this day, which is in some ways in uh, the Impressionist tradition of en plein air painting where I travel to places and make things because I, I, I don't trust other people to represent it for myself. I feel I need to go there. Um, two years later, I went back and did the same thing, and, and this sort of indicates how I was changing my way of working. And, and this is a, um, a series of... Uh, drawings with ink on mutsu paper where I actually represented the color of the sun shining through my, uh, my eye eyelids, so the capillaries, at different times of day. And um, you can see with the detail what, sort of what it looks like. So, so it be I became, um, as I was a, uh, a young artist in New York, I, I really became more interested in things that were visually interesting to me. I became I don't know whether less interested in conceptual things, but I found the work that was most engaging to me was work that had a sort of uh, a visual uh, aspect that was, uh, that was uh, interesting. And it also had to do with an increase in confidence in, on my part in, in working with materials and making something that is uh, um, uh, well-made and, um, and complex and interesting and even beautiful to look at. And you know, it's when you're sort of starting out as a smart ass, it, it's a, it takes a little while to, to reach that point. So um, uh, this is uh, work from around the, a little bit later and um, as, as the travel continued. And I, would, I had a full-time job at the time I worked in uh, educational publishing 
and I would take time off during the summer to work in the studio, and I also worked nights and weekends, of course, and, uh, and, I, would, and I, would, I would travel often to do one or two projects a year, and, and this was a project where I was really interested in the idea of making a blank image, and this is a, um, so I was trying to think of, well, what would be the ultimate blank image, and this is a, uh, a painting of the ceiling above Sigmund Freud's couch, so I did a series of paintings of uh, what the Annalisans saw when they looked up at the ceiling. And I did it at different times of day as the light changed on the ceiling. The shape is um, based on studies that Ruskin did in the 19th century of the human field of vision. So I, I used the form to sort of imbue the idea with, uh, with looking, with vision. And um, they, uh, this, was, um, this was a morning. This was in the morning. The walls are actually orange in that room, in the examination room, oddly enough. Um, uh, Freud had very sort of odd taste in, um, in art and also in, uh, in color, but I mean, it was also so much of his time. But the light is reflected more off the walls in, uh, in, this, uh, in, in the early morning one. And the, they're, they're painted in fresco, uh, so it was this totally crazy process. I learned how to make fresco, which was a, um, quite a, a challenging um, project. And, uh, and finally ended up with three good ones, which you can see here. And uh, so there are the three. So it's, it's, uh, that's Freud's ceiling in the morning, Freud's ceiling in midday, and Freud's ceiling in the, uh, in the late afternoon, which you can see in its sort of serial quality is very uh, Monet-like um, in terms of recording the, uh, the light conditions of a, um, of a particular place over time. Um, the, the choice of fresco, of course, was based on this idea, well, if you're going to paint a ceiling, you should use material that refers to the idea of the ceiling. And so I, I, did, um, I did fresco. I still remember trying to find out how to do fresco. And this was before the internet was really much. And I, I remember looking in the yellow pages and calling up fresco people. And uh, I remember one person saying, how did she, how did she put it? It was like, is this? Um, for uh, is this ecclesiastical or something? Is this is this religious or is this secular? What is your work religious or secular? Because most of the people who do fresco actually do do church interiors. I'd say, and so I said, I, I think in fact this is quite quite secular, <laughs> doing Freud ceiling, um, <laughs> and uh, they they still um, they sur they've survived. It's sort of you know some of this. It took me. Um, several attempts, several of them just sort of slid off the wall. I would think it would be finished. I'd get a, a friend to help me put it up on the wall, and then I'd come back in the morning, and the top layer of fresco would have slid off onto the floor by the morning. It was kind of depressing. But um, This is a, uh, a work also Monet-based. So, so this idea of series, this idea of seriality, is something that really intrigued me about Monet when I, when I could sort of admit to liking him. And this idea, it was, I was also really reacting against photography at that point. I, I, I um, have since contradicted myself in that way, as I have in most ways, been in that now I, I do more sort of photography. But at the time, I was very strongly against photography and this idea of photography's claim to truth with a, with a, with a singular image capturing um, some sort of uh, totality. Um, so I uh, decided to do a, uh, a sort of homage f to Monet. And so I, um, during my uh, vacation in the summer, um, I, I traveled to, to Rouen in France, where Monet did those 37 paintings of the cathedral. And I had all of my paper, I had my watercolors, I had, uh, I had uh, five days of reservation at this tiny hotel. I was all set to go. And I arrived there, and the cathedral was totally surrounded by scaffolding. <laughs> and uh, so I, I kind of had to think on my feet. Um, and I, um, I'm still kind of proud that I didn't like to sort of give up and, uh, and uh, you know, just go home. And so what I did, um, which was um, a little peculiar, was to, uh, I stayed in my hotel room for the whole time and recorded the changing light in the hotel room and created these drawings that are sort of a reverse impressionism. So the drawing on the left is all of the objects in the hotel room it sort of mapped out generally in their, in their position in the room. 
uh, viewed from uh, above uh, in morning and then noon and afternoon. And then if you look at the detail, you can see under each swatch, I wrote what it was. So these works exist uh, in the opposite way that, um, that, uh, that uh, Impressionism does. And in that when you're far away from it, it looks abstract. And when you get up close to it, oh, you realize this is actually a schematic, a drawing of a, of a, of a hotel room. And um, uh, it, um, it then becomes uh, this, this sort of uh, color field thing in, in the distance. Um, the, <laughs> all right, then, then this work is from about the same time. and. Uh, I decided that I wanted to, um, I wanted to, I was still working with color, uh, uh, and I wanted to do a work about the color blue. And so I decided to transmit my brainwave to outer space. So I had uh, the whole, how I got there is a, a kind of a long story, but I had my brainwave recorded while looking at the blue wave. You can see on the monitor there, I played the blue wave from Hawaii 5 a great 70s TV show, which was since resurrected and it's not so good second time around. So I had one second of my brainwave recorded. You can see the, uh, that beautiful old Mac that it was recorded on. It was actually this amazing Japanese scientist who was sort of, I worked with great people on this. This Japanese scientist was sort of this leading guy in biofeedback. Called him up, he picked up the phone and he helped me. And then the guy who designed the antenna was in Maine and is a fantastic guy uh, named Bill Olson who uh, designed this antenna. He mostly did um, uh, antennas for uh, ham radios. And he uh, agreed to do it for me even though he said, you know, it's in violation of F FCC regulations because you're, I needed, what I needed was a, um, was a frequency that, w or wavelength that would uh, not bounce back to Earth, but that would actually penetrate the ionosphere and actually go into outer space. Because I didn't want to bounce back, I wanted to actually be, I wanted this artwork to be traveling through outer space and it, for it to be about blue. So anyway, I sent, um, I sent this blue wave to, uh, to Regal, uh, which is, if you know any constellation, I don't know many, but I do know Orion, which is the belt, um, the three uh, stars in a row. Orion's left boot. Is, uh, is the bluest star in the night sky. And so I transmitted the signal of my brain wave looking at the blue uh, from Hawaii Five O to the bluest star in the night sky. And um, it's, uh, that's 970 light years away, I think, and this was done in 94, so that's almost 900. So it's getting there, it's 950, <laughs> 950 to uh, light years away, and it's, uh, it's, I'm also proud to say it's the biggest uh, sculpture ever made. Richard Serra has nothing on me because it's, it's only, it's only uh, two and a half centimeters high, but it's 186,000 miles long, that one second wave. It's really jumbo. Um, and then this, this I put in because it was about, it is about this, the optical mix. This was about um, more sort of uh, post-impressionism than impressionism. This was one of those, often when I would travel to these places to do these things, I would, you know, I would have this sort of panic, and I still do, and think, you know, you're a crazy person, um, why are you doing this? And this was a, um, I also had a brief moment where I was kind of obsessed with Jasper Johns, which has, um, Past, but the flag paintings and the idea of um, the the idea his his crosshatch paintings I still think I, I can't remember why but I, I I still think that they're 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 really pretty interesting anyway but this was was I went to um, <laughs> to Waterloo with this flag which is looks like a white flag but it's actually not a white flag it's um, it's uh, stripe strips of white fabric that are dyed slightly yellow and slightly, uh, slightly violet. And so it was sort of a, an optical test. Um, and so I took this, I sewed the strips together, made this flag so that the optical mix of the yellow and the violet based on all I had learned about Impressionism would be gray. And so it's called a uh, gray effect. And I took it to Waterloo, uh, went out on the battlefield, waved the flag for one minute, 
you know, walked around the battlefield, folded it back up, got on the bus, went back to Brussels, went to the airport, and went, went home. And um, this was one of those works that, um, well, it was never really very popular. It's still, needless to say, <laughs> it's still in deep storage in the studio. But I'm, I'm glad I did it. Um, and um, this is... Um, one of the things that I'm interested in about color and its relationship to language is, is, is color names and how we, how we name things and how, how inadequate our, uh, our language is for naming color and how inadequate our language is for the subjectivity of color and how it varies. So this is called a study for a groovy, unnameable color, yellowish green. And so what I was trying to do here was find the point where yellow becomes green. And it's uh, sort of interactive in a way, but it's um, uh, something that continues to interest me. Like, where do you say, and of course there are cultural differences uh, between, how, between color names and, and, and how things are named and aren't named, but also just between people and perception. And also uh, a, a, a single person at different times of day or depending on what you had for lunch, it can sort of affect your color. So that subjectivity of color is something that's, that's totally fascinating to me and comes up uh, again and again. Uh, this color piece was, um, you know, I, I still, I, I really don't believe in representation. I, do, I, um, I even though I do it most of the time, I, I, I like don't trust anything. And you know, if you look at a picture, you know that it's a lie. And so I was really trying to think of how do you make a picture of something that is, for for myself, as true as possible. What does that mean to make a true true picture? And um, so this was uh, from a series I did in 1997, 1998 of um, of uh, eye pokes. So what I did is I poked myself in the eye like this, and these shapes appear. So this is, can you, I can't read that on here. Can you read which eye that is? I think it's the left eye, uh, right eye. I don't remember which eye. I'm pretty sure it's a right eye, outside, medium pressure. So when you, uh, when you poke yourself in the eye, these shapes appear, and it's your own, you know? No, you're not make, no one's making a picture, no one's telling you what to see. It's your own picture that you're making for your very own self. Now, I'm not, I mean, if you want to do this yourself, you can, but I'm not gonna, don't blame me if something goes awry. But, <laughs> but for me, it's this idea of getting sort of beyond perception or beyond the sort of, the, the sort of our, our sort of perceptual apparatus and all this stuff that misleads us. So it was really an attempt to, um, to, to try to make a, 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 a picture that is something that's just mine and, um, and weirdly something that's visual but is not a visual stimulus because this is not something that goes through the pupil and to the optic nerve. It's something that is, um, is, is caused by, by, by pressure but ends up looking like a picture in the brain. Um, you know, it's all in your head as they say. Um, this is a similar uh, project from, uh, th this is from 2002, where I um, decided to keep track of uh, colors from my dreams. So it was a, um, a, a sort of weird project where I was um, just uh, watching my dreams, you know, keeping a dream diary and, and being sort of aware of, 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 of colors. And then when there was an interesting color, I would... Uh, I would write it down, and then the next day I would mix the ink and create this sort of Rorschach shape of the uh, of the of the color. So um, this is a. Um, I had lots of dreams of being chased, which is not unusual, and a lot of jobs, a lot of uh, a lot of dreams of being chased um, by the Russian mafia. And this was one where I was in a Mercedes limousine. You know, I also had you know dreams of grandeur. Um, <laughs> And with a ham in the back, and I was being chased by the Russian mom. So this is the color of the ham in the Mercedes limousine when I was being chased by the Russian mom. Um, and this is uh, one of uh, uh, a vest that Bob Dylan was wearing when he was singing on top of a skyscraper. So I continued, I did this for about two years, and then it was really destroying my sleep. And, and I, I learned that 
No, I mean, seriously, you're, like, you're trying to sleep, and then all of, this, all of a sudden this nice color comes up, and your, your conscious self says, oh, you know, that's a beautiful violet color. You have to wake up and write it down. And it, I, I later found out that people who keep dream diaries, and most people don't keep color dream diaries, but they keep dream diaries, often are very bad sleepers because they're monitoring uh, something that shouldn't be monitored. It, you know, it, it should be left alone. So after a little over two years, I just sort of stopped. I got to 102 of them and then sort of uh, gave up. But um, it was a way, again, of trying to find a color that was not represented, that was not in the world, but that was totally pure, that was this color that was in my head. It's only in my head. And, then, and so I knew it wasn't going to be polluted by my vision, by my, by my perception. It was right there in the brain where the color exists. And um, of course, the Rorschach uh, shape is connected to the idea of, of psychology and, and, and interpretation of, of color. Um, I mentioned uh, that I hated photography, and I, I've changed my mind, and uh, did this. Uh, uh, this is called uh, 42 Minutes, and it's uh, just a series of seven photographs taken out a window in Vermont as the sun was going down and the light was on inside. And it's, uh, uh, it, the window changes from transparent to mirror, and it's, it's weirdly connected to the work that's here at the IMA and where I'm really interested in this play between transparency and reflectivity. Um, I should move along more quickly here. Um, since I have 167, did I say 67 images? I meant 167 images. Uh, 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 this is a light piece that recreates a sunset. So I became interested in this idea of representing places based on the color of the light rather than what the place looks like. And so I have this device called a colorimeter, which is like a color light meter. And, um, and I use it to measure light in certain places and then, and then represent that, that light. And, um, and this, um, this is sort of a good lesson for um, young artists who are here, if there are any here. I can't see who's out there. Um, that this was a photograph that was taken that um, I had I actually had this piece photographed three times, and there was this guy who was actually able to make this incredibly luscious photograph. The photograph, I must admit, looks much better than the piece itself, and it's also something that's been reproduced many times. And so it's uh, a good idea to have uh, good photographs of your work because it, um, sometimes the photographs take on a life beyond the work itself. This is a stained glass piece. I've done a series of these that, that uh, shift light um, the light conditions using stained glass. So it's actually using the light of the sun. This was the first one I did, which was in San Antonio, and it, um, it's called Paris, Texas. And the light outside, of course, is the light of Texas, and the light inside is the light that I measured in Paris in the winter. So it shifts the light from the incredibly harsh yellow sun of Texas in the summer to this very blue uh, light of uh, Paris that I measured in the winter. And it's accurate for about four hours in the afternoon when the light is shining in a certain way. And this was a piece I did in Mass Mocha that uh, does a similar thing but shifts the sunlight to candlelight. Here's a work that's kind of connected to the, um, to the Freud uh, ceiling idea where I just recorded the, uh, the, the, the color of the wall uh, of my studio over the course of several days. So th this idea of imp the impossibility of making a picture of white. The wall is white, but of course, whenever there's uh, any shadow at all, it's, um, it's, it's got some sort of gray or some sort of color. And so um, I just kept recording the, and this was done to scale, it was half scale. So all these dots on the paper are, um, are, are at the position of the, uh, the wall as I was looking at. So it's really, <laughs> It's a little bit of a dull artwork, I must admit, it's sort of a picture of a blank wall. Over time, though, I might add. Um, uh, there's a detail. Um, this is a work I did. I, I had one of these amazing experiences in New York where I was um, on a subway, the F train, that comes up out of the ground in Brooklyn, and it um, it goes sort of over the Gowanus Canal, and uh, it had just rained. And uh, looking out from the train, someone saw 
a rainbow, which was an amazing thing to see in New York. It's one of those strange moments in New York where everyone becomes sort of friendly and, and sort of open and happy and like looking out. So everyone rushed to the side of the, uh, the train car where the, where the rainbow was, and the whole thing was tipping. It felt like it was going to go over. And it was just a really sort of special moment. And um, I, I didn't do anything about it. I, I wrote down a note about it in, um, in, my, in my sketchbook. I didn't do anything about it for a couple of years. And then I had this idea of doing a work about a rainbow. Um, you know, who doesn't want, want to make a picture of a rainbow? Um, and so what I did is I just went to, I went back to where I saw the rainbow from, from the F train, and then I sort of marked on a topo map where, uh, where I saw the legs of the rainbow and, um, and then went to those uh, places, which were both in Brooklyn, and just photographed what I saw there. So this was, these two photographs are the photographs of the end of the rainbow. And um, a friend of mine later pointed out that there were dumpsters in both of them, in both of the photos, that were probably full of gold if I had actually looked. <laughs> Um, this is a, a work that I did. I've been obsessed with uh, the poet Emily Dickinson for about 10 years, and this was one of the first pieces I did about her. Um, uh, yeah, I shouldn't even go into that, so I'll just, I'll just explain what this is. And, and this is a, uh, it's a passing cloud. It's the light of a passing cloud. So I wanted to do, for a long time, I'd wanted to do a work that's about that subtle experience you have, in this, especially in the summer, where you're inside or outside and a big cumulus cloud comes and blocks the sun and then passes. And that sort of shift in color, in intensity, in light, in energy, all of that is so, I mean, it's, it's, it's nothing and everything at the same time. And so I, um, I decided to, to do a work about a passing cloud, trying to, to, to recreate that somehow, which is, um, I realized that it's, that's the sort of idea that's really not for everyone. But, so at first I was doing it with all these computers and dimmers and had, it was really high tech. I had these fluorescent lights. They were, you know, the, they, this guy found a way of being able to dim it. And I really hated it. I hated doing it. I hated, I hated, um, I hated it being so techy. And so a friend of mine who is a, um, who's a choreographer was in the studio and, I, and he knows a lot about lighting. And I said, this is what I'm trying to do. And, um, and I had all these gels around that I was working with. And, and so he said, well, uh, why don't you try this? And so he, he took one of these, the, these gels come in sheets. And, I, um, and he crumpled one up, which I would never do because I, you know, they're quite expensive. And I think of them as art materials. But he's like in the theater, and they like crumple and do all kinds of things with these things. So he crumpled it up, and I had a, a clothespin hanging from the uh, from the ceiling where I would clip notes or things that I was working on. And he just clipped it to that. And at that point, we both knew that that was the solution. And so what I did is I created this cloud that has the effect of a passing cloud as you walk around it. So when you're in front of the lights, you have, it's the effect of daylight in Emily Dickinson's garden. And as you walk around this cloud made out of theater gels, it is the effect of a passing cloud where it dims the intensity and changes the, it changes the color and blues and purples it out um, because, of course, the cloud reduces the, uh, the, the uh, long wavelength light. And um, so I, uh, I can't really take full credit for this piece because I had a lot of help with it, but it was, um, it was so, it, but it was an important lesson for me because it's a kind of way of working and if there's something that you can make, that I can make myself, I much prefer to do it. And, and this is something that was, uh, was really totally fun to make. I've put it together maybe eight or nine times, and each time it's a little bit different, but it's a total pleasure to make. There you can see it. Here's a work um, based on a, a, a different idea of color that is um, the, uh, uh, it was based on this idea. I was reading uh, Nabokov's autobiography, Speak Memory, and there's this point in there, or I should say I, I was starting Nabokov's autobiography. I think I probably didn't finish it. But I got to the point of, auto, of his autobiography where I found something I could use. And, uh, and he had this thing called colored hearing, where he associated a color with every letter in the alphabet. And so I thought, oh, that is fantastic. And so, and it was very specific uh, uh, what the color was. So it would be like T he associated with um, 
the color pistachio. Uh, um, C was a, uh, mother, a combination of mother of pearl and, and azure. Um, I was gold, E was yellow. Um, uh, he, let's see. G was the color of, of brown shoelaces. So it was very, very weird things. Um, so I, I had this, I, and so I mixed the ink and then I didn't know what to do with it. It was one of those things where you don't know what to do with half an idea. And so it sat around, you know, what do you do? Do you like spell your name out a hundred times? Do you uh, take Nabokov's, uh, you know, book and transliterate it? I, I didn't know what to do with it. So I put it aside and eventually I, I picked it up a, a year or two later and realized that um, I had the perfect text, which was Heisenberg's Uncertainty Principle, which had been right in front of my nose the whole time. And so what I did is I transliterated about 15 pages, the sort of crucial pages, of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle using Nabokov's system of colored hearing and created this huge mural of, um, of, of colored dots. So basically I took every letter in that text and um, translated it to a colored dot, added up all the colored dots, divided it up over the whole mural space, and then dropped those, that number of each of the 26 colors onto, onto the mural. Um, the text is, um, and I'm going to be very careful here because I once was talking about this piece and there was a, um, an astrophysicist in the audience who, uh, who corrected me. So I'm no expert. But uh, it is um, the uh, Heisenberg's uh, uh, um, uh, um, uncertainty principle basically says that you cannot, uh, as soon as you measure something, you change it. So you cannot, you cannot observe the uh, direction and momentum of something, of a particle at the same time. Because as soon as you're measuring the particle, in order for it to be observed, you, a photon is, is emitted from the particle, and so it actually changes the, um, it changes the, uh, the, the direction and momentum of, of, of the particle. So this idea, it's basically this idea of as soon as you look at something, you change it, which is only really true. Um, for on a subatomic level, but for me, I, I love that idea, and it again goes back to Monet's idea of of, um, of seriality and looking at something. Every time you look at it, it's different, and you try to record it differently. And this idea of sort of total subjectivity: as soon as you look at something, you change it, which is um, an idea an idea that I love. Here is a work that um, I uh, showed in Chicago. Uh, that is. Um, a, uh, based on the, the uh, light of Niagara Falls at a moment when it is totally obscured by mist. Um, these are drawings that I did, um, kind of hard to photograph. I, it took me a long time, but I, I sort of I, I bullied my way into the uh, cave at Lascaux, got in there, and it was sort of a strange request, which the archaeologist was a bit surprised to hear and finally came around to letting me in. I wanted to be in the cave in darkness and do drawings of Lascaux in darkness. And, uh, and so that's what I did. And then, of course, you know, the French being the French and so bureaucratic, I said, well, we're, since we're in here, can I see the rest of the cave? She said, no. <laughs> so so I, I have the, I, I, the sort of unique experience of being in the, the real cave in Lascaux in darkness but not actually seeing really any of the wall drawings. So I, I, I was kind of stupid. But. There's a different one. You can see there's actually a kind of significant difference. Here's a work that I did that was sort of a, a combination between um, Monet and, uh, and Henry David Thoreau, and where I took all of these reproductions of Monet paintings and walked around Walden Pond and then recorded the colors that I saw in Walden Pond on the, uh, on the Monet reproductions. Um, and uh, you can see the sort of marks there. So I'm going to start breezing through things now because I've been blabbing on. So um, uh, this is a work that I did uh, that is about um, the sunset in Monument Valley. It's a video piece that was crazy and incredibly complex. But basically what it does is it reproduces the changing light over 30 minutes in my motel room in Monument Valley using images cut from the famous John Ford film, The Searchers. Um, so all these stills uh, that project onto the wall and, and create, the, create the light that I measured on the wall. You can see the images there. 
of the uh, of the stills. This is a big molecule piece that I did in Venice that is uh, that was based on um, the uh, molecular formula of moon dust. So those are almost like little they're little chemical models of uh, of the different uh, constituent parts of, of moon dust. And here is a work that actually was based on Monet. It's the uh, it's called Painting Air. It's the seven uh, pigments that Monet used to paint the color of the sky. Uh, this is from a series that I did of, um, of glacier drawings where I used ice to make paintings of uh, photographs of glaciers that I did. So I, I froze ice and ink. So it was ink mixed with different proportions, different density of color. And I had a big freezer of different colored ice in the studio and then used it to make these drawings. So I just would, I would crush ice, I would smash ice, I had different techniques for getting different effects of the, uh, of the, uh, of the glacier. Um, this is a work I did in St. Louis a couple years ago that was, um, they wanted a light work because there was a Dan Flavin show. And, uh, you know, it's, I mean, I, I didn't really want to, you know, be under that particular shadow. So I decided to do something a little bit different where I um, created a, um, I went out there and I um, did uh, uh, watercolor studies. This is where I was working and doing these studies of the, uh, of the sunset in St. Louis. And then I created a um, solar powered, um, you can see the solar panels on top of the museum there, and a solar powered ice cream machine that created ice cream in the colors of the sunset, like uh, five colors of the sunset from the, uh, from the watercolor that I did. So it was totally powered by the sun, and it created a pretty picture, as a picture of the sunset. And um, you know, everyone wants to make a picture of the sunset. Um, here, and it was right across from a school. And so it's very popular. Um, there are the colors uh, of the um, of the work. This is a piece I did that um, uh, recreates moonlight, um, shifts sunlight to moonlight. Uh, this was a work that I did that recreates the shadows. These I, I have these amazing shadows that come off the street from the street lamps and the passing cars. In my, in my studio, and so I just decided, I tried to make a film of it and it was impossible to do, so I decided to be more theatrical and created it. So what there is is there's lights over on the right side there and that sort of shine through these shapes that recreate the shapes of the window. And then I have a little locomotive, a toy train, with a, uh, with a flashlight on top of it that goes around this track and that creates the exact, um, this sort of movement of light up the wall that happens when cars pass by the studio. Here's a big piece, not as big as the piece in outer space, but big. Um, <laughs> that is of the uh, that was a, a design project I did um, at uh, the New Johns Hopkins uh, Medical Center in Baltimore, and this is based on this is based on the studies I did in Giverny of of, of Monet, and it's uh, this the, the that's the children's tower, and then on the left with the green ones are the uh, the adults tower. It's 250,000 square feet of glass. Um, and I was really worried that this was going to be, I, among my, I mean, many neurotic fears, I had this fear that this was going to be a disaster and that I was going to be stricken ill in Baltimore and be taken to the hospital in an <laughs> ambulance. And they would re refuse to treat me because I had made such a mess of this incredibly expensive facade of their hospital. Um, but so far, well, so far I haven't gotten sick in Baltimore, so who knows what will happen. Um, this is the painting, is a painting of Wisteria that was based on. This is a work I did one summer ago in Folkestone in England, which was about color. Um, and it's this wheel that you, um, that you match, you spin the wheel and match the color of the, uh, of the sea at a particular time of day. So this was done, there was someone called an invigilator, which is a very English word, meaning uh, someone like a docent. Um, who would come at noon every day to the uh, seashore, uh, uh, spin the wheel, match the color of the uh, sea to one of the 100 colors on the wheel, and then go into town and raise a flag of the matching color. So, um, 
so they could, uh, so people who couldn't make it over to the sea side would know what color the sea was that day. So that is the color of the sea that day and the three previous days. Um, this was a work I did last year, um, in, that was first shown in Chicago and then in Storm King, which is a, a solar-powered lunar module. So it is, uh, it absorbs, it behaves just like the moon. It absorbs sunlight during the day and then emits light, the color of moonlight, at night. And then it was shown. Here's a shot of it in Storm King with the real, with the real moon. Um, uh, this is a work that I did that was just in. Uh, in Italy last fall, um, that's still up actually, it's an installation of fireflies. And uh, it's not, it's, um, it's just these LEDs that are, that are on these small sticks. And when it's dark, uh, it's programmed just so these fireflies uh, move around. And it's um, in a sort of, uh, uh, sort of crazy reasoning that I can't even understand myself anymore, it's all based on the movements of the characters in the second act of Hamlet. So they all sort of move around. This is where it was first shown in, in Paris and where it's actually hanging from the ceiling um, as they move around. Um, this was a work sort of connected to the dream work, which is uh, also colors in my head. And it's a, a sort of grid of colors going across are uh, colors from um, my dreams and going up and down are colors from my memories. So these are all colors, uh, it's sort of a grid of color from my dreams. And this is the, uh, there's a detail, this is the uh, last piece. Um, and this is a work that I just completed that's in San Diego, that is on the top of these two, two skyscrapers. And it's a, uh, it's called Weather Report. And it, um, if the weather is going to be nice the next day, it, it uh, um, the light boxes on top of the buildings illuminate with this sort of, uh, well, it's based on a watercolor study I did of the, um, of the sunset in California. It's, sort of, it's based on this uh, old rhyme, red sky at night, sailors delight. So if it's illuminated this way, it means it's going to be a nice day the next day. If it's illuminated, um, whoops, if it's illuminated this way with the gray, it, um, it means it's going to be not such a nice day the next day. So it's, uh, um, that people in the buildings have already started complaining about the accuracy of the uh, prediction. <laughs> it's like you think, oh, never know. Um, so uh, there's a there's a close up of it, and that's it.